Hello everyone, um, welcome to Gerald Space and um, thank you for coming along to tonight's talk which is part of the event series to accompany the um, Gerald FEU Awards Borrow Time Exhibition which comprises of two um, new moving image commissions by Alice May Williams and Karen Kramer. We're going to keep the exhibition open as well um, after the talk has um, finished so you'll be able to have a look if you haven't had the chance already. So this is the fourth event that we've done as part of the series. Um, the fifth and final will be a talk by Owen Hathaway, um, which will take place on Friday the 15th of April, and that will take place at the Royal College of Art in Battersea. So if anyone would like to come along to that, then you can reserve a ticket online, or you can speak to me at the front desk at the end of this talk. So, I'm really delighted to welcome Lawrence Scott, who will present a talk that further develops the catalogue tax that he was commissioned to write for the exhibition, which coincidentally is available to buy for one pound on the front desk. He will talk for approximately 45 minutes and there will be an option, an op sorry, opportunity for questions at the end. So Lawrence Scott is a lecturer in English language and creative writing. He is the author of the four dimensional human ways of being in the digital world, which was shortlisted for the Samuel Johnson Prize in 2015. In 2011, he was named a New Generation Thinker by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and the BBC has since written and presented programmes um, for Radio Free's The Essay and The Sunday Feature. His essays and criticism have appeared in The Guardian, The Financial Times, and The London Re um, Review of Books, among other publications. In 2014, he won the Royal Col um, Society of Literature German Prize for Nonfiction. So we encourage tweeting here at German Visual Arts, so if you'd like to um, join the conversation, our handle is Gerard, J um, at Gerard, J-V-A, and the film um, FEUs is Film Fed Umbrella, and the hashtag is um, Gerard FEU Awards. And finally, um, we are filming tonight's talk, so if um, you do not want to be re uh, reproduced in that, then please let me know at the end. So please join me in welcoming Lawrence Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Can everyone hear me okay at the back, yeah? Thank you all for coming. This is a wonderful turnout. It's a real uh, uh, honor um, to be speaking to you tonight. I just wanted to quickly thank Stephen Bode, who is here, and Shona Manson, who is not. Uh, they were the two who originally sort of um, thought up the idea to commission me for uh, the Borrowed Time catalog essay. Uh, they, they'd read my book and thought that I might have some uh, take on the projects that could be of interest and sort of increase uh, or contribute in some way to the conversation. Um, thank you to all at the Jewed space as well, um, and very much, Lauren, for organising this. Uh, there was a summer rain shower on the way over here, and I really, it really struck me that it, I was walking along to the tube and thinking, we are in a new season almost all of a sudden. It was sort of the first time that the rain had felt summery and humid. Um, we've just had the equinox a few, a week or so ago, I think. Um, so those of you that are up on your fairy or folklore, will know that this sort of, we're just at a hinge moment of the year where, so this saying goes, uh, the boundaries between our world and other dimensions are at their thinnest. So it's a good idea to be sitting here together thinking um, and discussing time and temporality. Um, the topic of my talk today will be sort of expanding on the, uh, the essay in the catalogue, but really it'll be more about the notion of time and conquest. Time is a spoil of war. Uh, time is a flexing of political muscle. This will be the sense, I'll try and make a case for the idea that time is a form of politics. Uh, I will be talking between about 40 and 45 minutes, and I'll stop uh, on time, I promise. This isn't an entirely scripted talk, though I have prepared it. Um, I do, I've been to enough academic conferences that, um, I don't know about you, but being read at for 45 minutes can feel like a form of assault. Um, so I'm not going to read at you, so I'm just going to... Um, uh, do a few short readings from my book and the rest will uh, be in sort of lecture style. So, um, if we look back at the history of time and the idea of time as a form of political conquest, we can go back to the 7th century BCE when one King Pompilius, he adjusted the haywire calendar of Romulus, which had only 10 uh, months and so it kept cycling round. It had no fidelity to season. There was no sense that um, September would always be autumnal, for instance. So he added in 
um, two more months, January and February. And keep your eye on January because we're going to be returning to this month later on. Uh, several centuries later, uh, the Roman Senate renamed the erstwhile fifth and sixth months of the uh, calendar, the Romulan calendar, to honor Julius Caesar and Augustus, which is where we get obviously July and August. And they were, I always sort of um, feel glad for July and August because they've been saved from the humiliation suffered by September to December, the 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, being all out of numerical sync. So that really, that renaming was sort of a, um, a lifeboat for them. Um, so that was one way in which time had to be sort of reordered and was sort of reflecting certain political agendas and the way in which we count time. Uh, in the French Revolution, now we're jumping several centuries ahead, there was, of course, the Republican calendar. And for 12 years uh, that the Repu after the Republicans sort of seized control, they had their own revolutions calendar, revolutionary calendar, which was very trippy. Uh, there is an example of it. Um, I think this, is, this says the third uh, year of the Republic, the Republican calendar. Uh, this is from 1794. And there were all sorts of dreamily uh, named months in this. One was uh, Brumaire, nice and misty, uh, Floreal, Thermidor, things like this. The, day, the days of the week had 10 days, uh, and there was three of them a month, and they were called decades. Um, so it was all uh, very much the idea that when you seize control, if you seize the way in which time is counted, you're somehow putting a stamp on your own sort of legitimacy. This may seem like a strange sort of enlightenment idea, but it was reenacted again during World War II. Uh, if anyone's read Jean-Paul Sartre's uh, wartime trilogy called The Paths to Freedom, in that there's an amazing scene where the French soldiers get rounded up under occupation and they're made to adjust their watches. And Sartre writes, they had to set their clocks to true conqueror's time, the same time as ticked away in Danzig and Berlin. And Sartre had a lovely detail about these soldiers as an act of sort of political resistance uh, of refusing to set their watches to the new conqueror's time and just letting them wind down. China, as you may know, has a single time zone, which sort of is sort of emphasis, to emphasize, I would imagine, sort of the imperial unity of the nation. Um, also GMT, we can't absolve ourselves, this idea that time starts with us, is it, you know, everything is a standard right down the British Empire's line through which all the other countries are measured. So power has always been wielded through the pendulum. Uh, now my uh, sort of task here today is to consider the ways in which the de digital revolution has also tried to wield time through the pendulum and how it's made its own campaigns on how we experience time. Now there was a weird early failed coup of this that was uh, perhaps sort of overambitious. I don't know if any of you remember this, but in 1998, the Swatch company tried to step in and thought that they would take over how uh, internet time was measured. So internet time was suddenly called BMT, the B standing for BL uh, in Switzerland, where Swatch is based instead of Greenwich. But even this BMT to GMT switch was purely ceremonial and an act of political uh, sort of uh, muscle flexing, if you will, because the whole point of it was that there was no um, geographic time. It would standardize time so that the day was divided into a thousand beats and we'd all be literally marching to the same beat wherever we were, whether in Auckland or London, the beat would be the same. And um, if you see some Swatch watches from this period, I think you'll see there's a BMT uh, measure still on it as this vestige of a failed coup. And it really interests me that um, we couldn't really stomach the severing of geography from uh, time, that time has to be linked somehow to the real physical world. We weren't willing to say that the one hour could be night time in one, the same hour could be night time in one country and breakfast time in another. That there's something about the rhythms of that that was just uh, intolerable to us. Uh, the writer Elizabeth Bowen, uh, she's an Anglo-Irish writer as they call her, um, she wrote, a, she was friends with Virginia Woolf and she wrote a letter during wartime from Ireland to Wolf in London, uh, saying that all the petrol has stopped because of the war, and we're going to have to get, uh, or we're, going, we're immobilized at least until we get new ideas about time. And here was the sense in which the military 
um, sort of superstructure of World War II was reconfiguring people's ideas of how time was progressing and demanded new ideas on time. So although that the Swatch campaign was a failed uh, coup, as I say, a failed raid on the temporal status quo, um, the digital revolution has instead acted much more subtle uh, manipulations and power games about how we tell what time it is. We've talked so much in the last sort of 20 or so years about cyberspace, but what is cyber time like? Um, and I want to sort of uh, begin by examining the controlling of time as a form of power. And of course, whenever there's power, there's always money sort of closely related to that. So how does social media, for instance, to take one branch of the digital revolution, make us think differently about time? Uh, you may remember a few years ago, it feels like a few years ago, who knows, it's hard to keep track, but uh, suddenly in, in my timeline at least, people started putting up pictures and having the acronym TBT, which is fairly well known to us now as Throwback Thursdays, the habit of putting nostalgic pictures up and a caption and all of a sudden people um, that you know quite well are suddenly 18 and gauche again. Um, and it began by a sports blogger, so the story goes, putting up old running shoes. He wanted to sort of honor these old additions that were being forgotten about in the wave of improvement and innovation. Um, I wanted to just show you, this is a very generous example of what a TBT, purely for illustration purposes. Um, so say this is my timeline. I just want you to consider this image for a moment. Um, this is from uh, Dublin in 2002. I think it must have been the era of Avril Lavigne because I thought that it was a brilliant idea to head out into the pub, you can see my Guinness there, in a very tight uh, top man top. Um, and it's really, this top is a real example of late, weary late capitalism because I was too old for all of the bands who were mentioned on this rock and roll t-shirt and someone who's 10 years old is saying, how do you know about UKDK? And I'm like, oh, I don't know, I just bought it at Top Man. And then, um, yeah, there is the jaunty tie slung without a collar and obviously impressive mane of hair. Uh, so this would be the sort of thing that would appear on people's um, timelines. Uh, and I thought this, this could be a perfectly logical, voluntary um, use of social media to sort of remind people that it isn't all about the present, it isn't all about the future, that social media is also an archive of the past. But the more I thought about this, the more I realized that Facebook is um, encouraging us all the time to think of the past on its own terms. In the last year or so, I think if you notice how Facebook is recoding itself subtly, it's really trying to establish itself as the official chronicler of our own pasts. Some examples of this are, uh, suddenly these uh, posts arrive in the timeline saying, here's what you were doing four years ago. There was a friend of mine recently, and he never uses Facebook, uh, and he has a really boring profile because of it, and he uses it, you know, maybe once a year. But Facebook pressed on gamely, nevertheless, and said, here, this is what, you're, uh, that, this is what you were doing four years ago. <laughs> and the post read, no phone till tomorrow or Friday. <laughs> that was it. That was the best they could do in the way of sort of reminding him of the excitement of his 20s. Um, and I, f I find this sort of a really sort of cunning slippage that we're experiencing between documented life and our own history, the sense that um, the way in which we're coaxed to remember things is based around what we have posted, such that Facebook is becoming, or trying to insert itself, assert itself as a dominant sort of mode of our own remembrance. There's also friendship anniversaries, and this is another way that Facebook can seem really gauche and sort of tactless in a way it can say, uh, you know, celebrate your relationship with this person, you've been friends with them for eight years, but they could be their brother or your sister, and it's though Facebook has introduced you, the sort of the, that sort of childish triumph with which they advertise this connection uh, to these friendships that long exceed it. Uh, also, the sense that happened more at the beginning, but Facebook was always trying to push on us this idea of um, these are people that you may know from your pasts. So our old sort of high school friends are being, that we thought were, dead and gone from our lives, it sort of grabbed our ankle like the villain in the horror movie. Um, and all of a sudden we're being sort of tethered to our pasts in an interesting way. I just want to do a quick reading now uh, from the book 
uh, which is all about uh, the impact that I think the digital revolution has had on the way in which maybe future high school reunions will be held. Uh, because I was reading a Philip Roth novel, American Pastoral, and I noticed his description just in the 90s of a school reunion was very different from how it would go now. So I'll do, I'll do this with one hand. Um, in Philip Roth's American Pastoral, the narrator Nathaniel Zuckerman describes the uncanniness of attending a 45-year high school reunion in 1995, just as the early web was being spun. Classmates laugh and scream as they try to dig each other's young faces out of 60-something landslides. Nathaniel begins to view the whole thing as a joke, quote, as though 1995 were merely the futuristic theme of a senior prom that we'd all come to in humorous papier-mâché masks of ourselves as we might look at the close of the 20th century. This is me again. Thanks to Facebook, those classmates are now coming with us and we'll watch them age in installments. Reunions of the future will lack some of the explosiveness of Roth's ball, where, quote, time had been invented for the mystification of no one but us. Instead, they may be more like animated and hopefully more tender versions of the subdued retro mingling that goes on in social media news feeds. In the scramble of Facebook migration, many old faces from my high school and university days that would once have been lost in time have stowed aboard. True to life, we never interact, but I keep them there almost superstitiously, and they pop up now and then in the trench of my time wasting to advertise the latest increment of their aging. I'm always interested in some things that will grow extinct in the digital age. I really think the cliche of the board secretary, I picture her sort of working for a gumshoe in a private detective's office in sort of 1950s movies, that sort of cliche of the bubblegum blowing, nail filing secretary is one of the extinctions of the digital revolution um, because she would just be rightly on her phone now or on the internet doing something more interesting than filing her nails. That sense that we encounter people who are just beached where they are, unable to do anything else, is increasingly sort of an anachronism or an, sort of a, an endangered species, at least. One other, um, therefore, extinction to the time is, I think, uh, you may have noticed this yourself, the idea of the airport reunion, where you see a friend, say, who you haven't seen in three years, round the corner of the gangway with their suitcase, and that old experience of just mentally adjusting to what time has done to them over the last three years. Just that, oh, you're, you're three years older now. That sort of little frisson of being in time and noticing time's effects that you can do in this way uh, will no longer be as potent in the digital age when we're sort of seeing people all the time or in drip feeds of the, of the aging process. Now, this is a really conservative view of self-formation, I should add, that this new way in which uh, online lives are sort of catalogues of our pasts that are always retrievable, that we can always grab, that we, uh, we can never outrun our old friendships or relationships. Um, this is a really interesting sort of juxtaposition with how the web was imagined in the 1990s. And it's good to revisit some of our utopian dreams sometimes. Um, in 1996, funnily enough, also in Switzerland, Switzerland seems to be sort of a key place, coincidentally, um, there was a writer and activist called John Perry Barlow, and he wrote in 96 a declaration of the independence of cyberspace, which was an open letter addressed to what he called the uh, governments of the industrialized world. In this open letter, he says, your legal concepts of property, expression, identity, movement, and context do not apply to us. He had a bodiless, amorphous view of people uh, and how they would migrate online. That once we went online, we would be shackled from our personal histories. We could have shape-shifting identities. And this was very much in the mood of the 1990s anyway. Judith Butler's gender uh, trouble had just been published. The whole idea of gender as a performance, the idea that we were performing our whole identities um, very much fit this early use for online life. This idea that we could go online and be someone else entirely. Uh, he, so he writes, our identities have no bodies, so unlike you, we cannot obtain order by physical coercion. Ours is a world that is both everywhere and nowhere, but it is not where bodies live. And this is really crucial, uh, this is not where bodies live, because we know 
that the biological body lives, alas, in time, that it cannot be severed in the same way, it cannot be rendered timeless in the way that our online lives can be. Early chat rooms were places of experiment with these shape-shifting identities. There were MUDs. I, was, I never really got into MUDs, but they were called multi-user domains or dungeons, and people could create avatars and go on and, and sort of interact with one another. Um, and no one really knew sort of the truth behind anyone's identities. It, it, the theme of this exhibition is borrowed time. People could borrow pasts, borrow histories as they saw fit. Um, so there was this famous cartoon, which may or may, may not be familiar, from The New Yorker. Um, it's a bit blurry at the bottom, but it's one dog talking to another, and the dog saying, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Uh, and this sort of stood for this sort of idea that who you were talking to could be a completely different age, uh, race, sex, whatever, uh, to how they were presenting themselves. Now, it's not surprising, really, that this sort of sense of excitement over outrunning our pasts, outrunning our particulars, was soon co-opted by uh, the corporations who were organizing the internet for us. Let's put it like that in a quite friendly way. Um, in 1994, Microsoft, does anyone remember Microsoft's slogan from 1994? Not on the tips of people's tongues. Um, it was, uh, where do you want to go today? And this sort of summed up the sort of is a double sense of adventure and outrunning your own pasts. If you notice, all the early, the language surrounding the early web has this sense of adventuring and going somewhere. The browsers would be called things like Safari, Navigator, Explorer. The, we use the verb surfing the web, a lot, that seems dated to us now. We're now more, you know, immovably online. Being on, being on the internet isn't a different state. It's just almost like being awake. It's just a sort of an aspect of one's ongoing uh, daily personality. We are online. Um, so Google Chrome, if we compare to Microsoft's Where Do You Want to Go Today? Google Chrome markets the internet to us in a completely different way. Um, it has a series of adverts. One of them is called Jest Time. Um, and it's, it's about a, a young woman who's going off to university, and it's about how she's using Google Chrome's uh, chat software, like, you know, the Skype version of Google Chrome, uh, FaceTime and stuff like that, um, to talk to her dad, um, who's back at home. And Jess is, has no mother, to add to the pathos and, of the scenario. Um, and the father and his relationship is really important. So it's all about her being at university, but not really being there, saying she feels homesick. And he is like, which tie do you think should I go on this date with? And she's like, that one. And it's very sentimental. And it, if I hadn't had much sleep, I'd cry whenever I show it to people. I'm not going to show it tonight, but I can gauge how many hours of sleep, depending on how wet my eyes get. But um, yeah, it's totally manipulative, manipulative. And all about this idea that, you know, there's a... Uh, there's a surrealist image that the founder of surrealism, André Breton, had in the 20s, and he said that he thinks of beauty or something as a train ceaselessly rushing out of the Guerre de Lyon, and yet which never leaves. And I love this image of our digital lives as being one in which the train is constantly running out of the platform, and yet we don't go anywhere. And this sort of described to me Jess's sort of strange half-life between one place and another. So Chrome here, oh, and there's another one, which is even, way more sinister than sentimental, but it's about a guy who wants to get back with his girlfriend. So he assembles this multimedia uh, Google Chrome package um, to try and convince her to, that you know, they deserve to be together. And there's like old, again, manipulative footage of them cresting over a roller coaster together, or the bench where they broke up, and he sort of Google mapped it. And this is a strange sort of... Um, catalog of their relationship meant to say, you know, we deserve another chance. Um, Google Chrome, therefore, uh, depicts itself uh, not as some uh, place that will facilitate a journey, but as a rehabilitator and redeemer of the past. Its role being not to transport you into the, into the unknown, but to archive the treasures of personal history. There's also a, a huge trend for multimedia online baby books, so that when your baby's born, you have all this footage of them. And so there's toddlers running around now that have YouTube, who have YouTube presences before they can read, which is quite strange. Um, now, when, so in, in this sense, we have this idea that the past is always thickening around us. And this is sort of the new agenda of Web 2.0, to never forget 
who you are. Why the, here we come to sort of the idea of the questions of money, because online it serves corporations very well for us to know who we are. Our pasts are another treasure trove to the marketeers. Our past purchases illuminate our future ones. You know very well this model, um, people who bought this also bought that. If you have bought this, you may also like that. So this model of advertising very much hinges on us not being this shape-shifting amorphous self who may change their tastes, that the controlling interests of the internet very much uh, sort of um, encouraging us to make sure that we're consistent vicarish types, not sort of uh, digital super surfers and shapeshifters. The more our pasts are documented online, the more they can be monetized, the more advertisers can, in their cozy language, target us. Controlling time is therefore a key concern to those who shape our online lives. Now, it's interesting that the very form and the architecture of how social media platforms are built and continue to be built influence how we experience the passing of time. This uh, news story is still very much alive. Um, in the last week, Instagram has sort of started unrolling its non-chronological format so that it's no longer the most recent posts which will appear at the top of the timeline. It will, it will be now a new algorithm which decides that. Twitter started doing that. Facebook's been doing this for a long time, but Twitter started experimenting with this in December of last year, and it really made people up in arms because people who use Twitter in, in distinction from Facebook like the idea of Twitter being an unfolding newsreel where you can count on the top line being the present. It's how people follow breaking news stories, for instance. So last week, Instagram has began to um, offer this non-chronological reboot. And this is what they said officially. This is a, their official line. To improve your experience, your feed will soon be ordered to show the moments we believe you will care about the most. It's very kind of them. Um, thank God. Uh, so this is the way in which social media can warp our, warp our idea of what is the present, right? Um, the present moment is defined by what is most relevant, what we will care about the most. The moments of our lives will become ranked and assigned value. So in this way, we're sort of cultivating a new sort of biography or life writing, in a sense, in which the most popular or sensational aspects of our lives are the ones that will gain most currency. I teach a lot of American study abroad students um, and they're always between about 18 and 21. And I sort of get, a, I keep sort of up to date on what's worrying them and what's current in terms of uh, digital usage. And um, I was asking them, so what sort of worries you the most and what sort of words are the biggest insults or things that cause your anxiety? And they said, one of, one of them said, um, it's being irrelevant. And I, that really sort of chilled me to the core. In my day, in the sort of the archaic 1990s when I was a teenager, it was being uncool was the thing, you know, and that, and, or being a tryhard. And now we have this sense of being irrelevant is the idea of sort of that fills the younger generation with most dread. Note here too the corporatization of the language of relevance and irrelevance. Um, businesses, people say, I don't know that much about business, but I assume that businesses have to stay relevant. I feel like I've seen that on some reality show that helps businesses. You know, you must keep your business relevant. You have to keep moving forward. This is all the logic of capitalism. And so there is a strange corporatization of the younger generation that's happening. They feel they need to keep their profiles updated in order to sort of exist at all in the social media sphere. There's a neediness involved in all of this or associated with all of this that is the neediness of the business who needs clients. There's also clear financial language in Instagram's very idea of what will interest us most. Notice what interest being a monetary term of sort of what has sort of value, what will generate extra income. This idea that what is most interesting is what is most present is a significant one. There's a blogger uh, for lifehacker.com called uh, Eric Ravenscraft who recently wrote, Instagram, like Twitter before it, is starting to learn there's no money in letting your best posts disappear to the ravages of time. This is because wherever attention gathers, 
wherever more people are interested in the same post, the more marketeering advantages there are, the more um, hits it will get, the more advertisers can slot their advertising next to it. I was really sort of surprised at the general uh, weariness when Facebook started inserting adverts into our timeline. And so you would suddenly be looking through friends lines and there'd just be these adverts. And what struck me that there was no real outcry about this that I discerned, there's no sort of protest to this privatizing of our commons, our digital commons, because it just seems such a logical progression of the model that, oh yeah, this is gonna happen. We're being advertised to all the time. This is the next step. And there's sort of this sort of war of attrition where we just sort of accept these things. I'd like now actually to turn to um, another branch. I've been talking a lot about social media, but YouTube is another sort of arm of the digital revolution that is really impacting the way in which our pasts and our lives um, are being experienced today. Uh, YouTube is a great archive of old time. And that may not be the, necessarily the first thing we think of it as, but the first video ever uploaded to YouTube was in 2005, and it was by one of the founders, and it was, it was called Me at the Zoo. And um, it was really boring, and it was him, it was 18 seconds long or something, and he was standing in front of the elephant enclosure, and you could hear sort of bleats and various sort of home movie sort of cracklings and that rushing of air sound. Um, and he's saying, the thing about ele elephants is that they have really, really long da da da, and he's being sort of bawdy, I guess. And I thought that he meant, you know, he was gonna wrong foot us with, oh, they have really, really long memories. Instead, he said long trunks, but I thought, oh yeah, he thinks, you know, borderly genitalia, but he's going to wrong foot us and say memories, because it is um, both sort of myth and biology, a rare combination that elephants have these fantastically long memories. Um, they can sort of remember old sites, they can return to, you know, um, old family members and sort of mourn for them. Elephants are very strange temporally among the animal kingdom. And so I love the idea that YouTube began here in this really banal video, but it was by the elephant um, enclosure, this sort of symbol of memory and timekeeping. Um, YouTube thinks of its own activities chiefly in temporal terms. It sees itself as time's warehouse. This is from its own statistics page, which was, I um, looked at for the book a year or so ago, so it might be a bit out of date now, but back then they said uh, 100 hours of video is uploaded per minute onto YouTube. That means that over 16 years of content is added each day worldwide, which is staggering. This is largely not borrowed time, but stolen time. Um, sort of uh, copyright infringement stuff that we all are like, wow, I can't believe that hasn't been sort of siphoned out yet. Um, but YouTube is working on it every day. They have a content ID system, as they call it, which looks for such infringements. And it uh, scans over 400 years of videos every day. Um, despite this policing, YouTube is still deluged in old time, old moments, this borrowed without asking from the copyright holders. And for someone who had a 1980s childhood, um, you'll be aware that if you had one as well, and not just the 1980s, but particularly perhaps, um, a 1980s childhood is being resurrected on YouTube piecemeal. I often think of it as almost being dredged out of the canal, like a car being pulled up for some police investigation. Um, and oh, I wanted to read you, actually, because the person who wrote this who was, <laughs> seemed to put it a lot better than I could now. Um, so this is one of my experiences of... Uh, YouTube. Oh, I should say actually at first that I'll put a picture on. Um, this is from a 1980s Christmas time fantasy program. Does anyone recognize it? It's the Box of Delights. Um, and so my YouTube experience of time passing um, or being resurrected is linked to this um, weird show, The Box of Delights. The resurrection is occurring piecemeal. I remember when the world was young and YouTube was sparsely furnished. In the early days around 2006 and 2007, I would check it now and then to no avail for The Box of Delights, a BBC Christmas miniseries I'd seen just once at the age of about five or six. Only two scraps of detail remained in my mind. The first, 
a real old man on a real pony trotting inside a painting, the duo becoming painted themselves and disappearing around a mountain path. The second, an old woman scolding someone. Your wolves are frightening my unicorns. This is all I had to go on. For years, whenever these two memories would come to me, one after the other, the thick fumes smoking off them would give, in comparison, an exquisite emptiness to the present. Theirs was the heyday of my capacity for magic, no doubt enlarged by the time of year, when my secular schoolboy head was restocked with stars and donkeys and little babies up in the bright sky. Not being able to remember anything of the room I was in when I watched the Box of Delights, I tended to absorb these two rootless memories into a more vivid atmosphere from a few years later. A Sunday evening in my favorite childhood living room, the chronicles of Narnia piping away on the television, my mother nearby reupholstering a rocking chair. To borrow from Amazon, customers who think of the Box of Delights also think of the Chronicles of Narnia. But then, one day recently, my call down the well was answered with more than an echo. A YouTube search replied with six uncanny little stills, and my trained eyes knowing at once from their ample durations that they represented intact fossils. The opening scenes of episode one used the familiar tropes from the, this English yuletide genre. A steam train chugging through a faded winter's landscape, boarding school homecomings, boys acting voices all posh and reedy, plucked harp strings denoting the supernatural, trumpets denoting supernatural majesty. How quickly tedium set in. I was impatient not for what I'd forgotten, but for what I could half remember. I began to skip the story along, looking for the old man in the painting. When I found him, I did feel a frisson of recognition, but the overwhelming sensation was of estrangement from that potent atmosphere of my memory. Still hopeful, I went chasing after the old woman, tracking her from episode to episode across that flip book of frames that one riffles above the time bar. Everyone knows by now that you can never go back, so I'm not sure why I needed to relive out this anticlimax. YouTube is especially insistent on the other country quality of the past because it makes you view the past literally through the prism of the present. Loading up episode five, its title, Beware of Yesterday, being on trend, I continued my hot pursuit of the elegant old sorceress with a semi-transparent banner for accountants and taxation obscuring the lowest strip of the screen. My nostalgia thus imprinted with the Google search incarnation of my current woes I discovered eventually that I got the line wrong anyway. Keep your lions away from my unicorns, the old woman warns her and the hunter, whoever he is, as they course through the sky on sleighs drawn by their respective takes on flying reindeer. There we go. In the film version of Shirley Valentine, Shirley fulfills a fantasy of sitting at a table by the shore of a Greek island, drinking wine and watching the sunset. In the daydream, she knew exactly how it would be. However, she admits, now I'm here, it doesn't feel at all, or a bit like that. I don't feel at all lovely and serene. I feel pretty daft, actually, and awfully, awfully old. The future, when it comes, can make fools of us in this way, but equally so can the past. I'm able now to think of a cartoon that impressed me as a child, and within seconds be fairly sure of finding at least snippets of it on YouTube, or perhaps dubbed into other languages, so that my dear Super Ted has apparently learnt Swedish in the time we've been apart, and the Thundercats now roar in Italian. As I learnt from the Box of Delights, a snippet is often enough. A blast is all we really need from the past. For all its power, nostalgia is strangely lazy, and memory lane runs on a downhill slope. Had I wanted to, I could have tracked down my after-school companions, ordering DVDs online and assembling a retrospective, but those lost feelings were never quite worth the bother. Now, however, these fragments of the past are for the first time on tap, not stored away in boxes. Look how easily I was able to retrieve those images. Not since storybooks dominated childhood life have we been able to challenge the nostalgia of our earliest days by satisfying it so relentlessly. Although for decades we've had the ability to rove through the old times through song, in the first years we don't develop the self-conscious soundtrack to our lives that encases teenage terror and ecstasy in amber. Opening theme sequences were among the first messages that my generation sent out to greet our future selves with a pang, coming at us as they did day in, day out, as we rolled around on the carpet. 
What's more, YouTube can now almost move almost as quickly as our leaps from memory to memory so that we can curate an eternal, uh, external exhibition of our reminiscences. And that's what's so strange, that we can now just say, oh, that reminds me of this, and before we know it, be sort of lost on this loop of sort of nostalgia and almost in real time find visual sort of maps for our memories. So what are the implications for time and conquest, conquest this thickening of the past? Cyber time is big business, as I've been saying. Uh, Facebook, we're constantly told, um, borrows our time and sells it to third parties. So how that works is if people, whatever we upload, get sort of, if we've agreed to allow our data to be sort of accessed in this way, it is sold off in sort of uh, silent, vast auctions um, because it's very valuable, again, for this idea that what we um, are doing online can create a portrait of ourselves that can then be used for consumer purposes. It's interesting to think about our anxieties um, in this new digital age. There's a novel just out by Patrick Flannery um, called I Am No One, which is about an American college professor who suddenly receives menacing boxes, and when he opens them, um, they're just reams and reams of his internet history just sort of printed out, all his emails, all his past searches. Um, I did some tutoring when I was very poor for some very rich people, and all of them, as they were sort of sending their uh, children off to universities or applying, they would hire these companies to sort of clean up their social media profiles. Sort of, there's companies called things like Hygiene or Detox, which will erase, erase sort of um, uh, compromising posts, so pictures of you with that little white jut of the cigarette will be removed. And actually, all the time now, um, we're seeing the past being used as a sort of weapon. Um, an MP or a counselor recently um, had to sort of apologize from an ill-advised post from her teenage years. Let me just skip ahead. Um, this is sort of an apposite response. Um, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. 2015, we know. You can really chart um, our anxieties as well by what the superheroes are coveting. And in um, the latest sort of Batman reboot, you'll notice in the first ever episode of Batman the series that Catwoman appeared in, she was after this gold lame suit, I think. It was some sort of typically tediously gendered sort of fashion <laughs> commentary on what sort of a, a lady villain would want. Um, but in Anne Hathaway's remake um, as Catwoman, uh, she's after a program called Clean Slate, which isn't no longer after the large diamond, but after a program which will wipe her from all criminal databases. But what makes these times um, especially strange, and I'll stop shortly so that we can discuss some of these things, is the collision between these digitized forms of remembrance and nostalgia, the sense that we're packed inside our own pasts, that the present is stuffed full with the past, and, and at the same time as we have this quite retrograde cultural landscape in so many ways, um, there's this incredible sense of technological innovation all around us. So here we come, I'm actually out of order here, out of time, but here is my sort of digital temporal deity who is uh, the Roman god Janus, and this is where January comes back again. Janus is the god of thresholds, of doorways, of liminal spaces, it's who uh, January the month was named after, being the doorway from one year to the next. He's known as Temporis Orptor, so not just uh, thresholds, but the author of time. Um, and this is sort of represented in his two-facedness, one looking back and one looking to the future. I'm interested very mo at the moment very much in this idea of how the most cutting edge technologies have a sort of datedness to them. Anyone who's a sort of a sci-fi junkie will know that Captain Picard in Star Trek The Next Generation has had a Kindle since about 1989. Um, all those 1960s fears about artificial intelligence and now sort of month by month being revealed is coming true, the idea of you know, empathic sentient robots, the anxieties that a smart house or with the internet of things, the house will somehow become intelligent, that the house is listening to you. This has been already clearly documented that 
televisions are watching you, that phones are lis listening to you. Someone on my Facebook the other day said to Apple that they didn't appreciate what happened was on their TV an Apple advert was playing and their phone, which was on nearby, chimed in and started playing the same advert in time with that, so creating this round surround sound advertising. This sense that the phone is this strange spy in our homes is really an old sort of anxiety. I've been re-watching on Amazon Prime, A Sign of the Times, um, the first season of The X-Files. Um, and I, I, was, I, I was about 14, I was their des like primary market at the time, and I was living in Canada. The X-Files were on all the time, and I never really watched it. Uh, but I, one thing I will say about time is that maybe I was about 14 then. I assumed, just from the glimpses that I saw, that Mulder and Scully were like in their mid-50s, at least. <laughs> And then I watched it again, and I'm like, oh my god, like, uh, Scully is like a fetus, she's so young. I'm like, my god, Scully's skin tone, it's amazing, I want that skin tone. Duchovny's this, David Duchovny's this twinky little dude. Um, uh, so that's one, one of time's tricks it plays. But anyway, so um, watching the X-Files, you really realise how old our new anxieties are, that they have, they trot out all these old, whenever there's not an alien episode, but a technology um, episode about machines sort of giving messages or um, sort of uh, networked buildings becoming sentient and uh, dropping people in elevators to their certain doom. All of these are old anxieties and they're happening now. So sewn into our innovation is a strange sort of sense of datedness. Um, I just want to talk briefly, just to sort of open up the conversation to the two works that are in the Borrowed Time exhibit at the moment. Um, Alice May Williams' uh, wonderful uh, video installation about Battersea Power Station, I really think represents this doubleness or manages to capture the sense of doubleness in the work. You'll know um, perhaps that Battersea is replacing the development company, I should say, it's not doing it itself. The development company with huge sort of international investment interests has, is sort of taking down the old chimneys and remaking them with sort of new technology and making them safer and whatever. But what's really potent as a symbol of all of this is the idea that this new technology will still cast an old shadow. And I think there's real poetry in that this idea of the, the Battersea skylines, silhouette remaining the same, and almost the shadow of the past being concretized. When you watch, if you haven't already, the, uh, Williams's work, uh, she says, the narrator in the voiceover says things like, are these future plans or reenactments of the past? And there's a strange sort of hypnotic, it's based around this idea of mindfulness class, and, um, there's a strange sort of hymn-like structure to the narration. Here comes, here comes, here comes the unreal city, here come the developers. And this to me captures the sense of the future, the Janus face looking that way, and innovation. <clears throat> but then the tide, as it, as it were, turns, and the narrator starts saying, there goes, there goes, there goes this, there goes the old businesses that were there, there goes the old inhabitants, there goes the old community. There's a tidal rhythm to her work. This doubleness is also evident in her narrator saying of the developer's announcements that she can't tell if they are a promise or a threat. The show also shows how time slips and slides out of the marketeer's hands. Um, Battersea, the whole Battersea project of innovation is really strangely done because when you look at the uh, the website and how they describe it, they say, you know, Battersea is time solidified, it's solid history. But that's no good for people who are selling new things to us. We want things to be new and improved. So the rhetoric totally breaks down. They say, in the next breath almost, Battersea is timeless, it's, it's original. So which one is it? Does it represent the 1930s and this nostalgic spirit of industriousness? Or is it a timeless creature out of history? Language itself almost makes a mockery of this type of co-opting of time. Time refuses to be co-opted in this way. It refuses to be borrowed for commercial purposes fully. In terms of borrowing time, um, in the literature and mythology of our civilization, people who borrow time end up not faring too well. Um, going back to the fairy tales, wanderers who step inside the fairy ring go into fairyland and then think they've been gone for two hours and return and everyone they know is old and wizened. 
Um, in the 19th century, we had Dorian Gray, who tried to freeze time very famously um, and borrow time. And although he was so beautiful and remains so, throughout the novel, people become increasingly afraid of him. They start calling him Devil's Bargain. Um, and where once he was welcomed at all the dinner parties in town and high society, people sort of shun him and sort of are strangely afraid of him. The Devil's Bargain is an, an allusion to Faust here, and Faust, as I mentioned in the essay, is our time borrower extraordinaire. Faust always wants the night to last forever, so he can do all sorts of stuff in it. So he's always making deals to um, borrow time. But the payback for him is when the gates of hell and other thresholds swing open and he gets swallowed up by demons at midnight, another liminal hour of the day. I think this doubleness then, if we have Williams on the one side with that work, Karen Kramer's work, The Eye That Articulates Belongs on Land, um, is about the Fukushima, um, another power station, that sort of disaster and the aftermath and there's um, strange haunting images of all the shops sort of abandoned and broken and she focuses a lot on the shoreline. So that sort of joins the two exhibitions as well, this notion of the tide and the coming and going. Um, she, uh, her voiceover says in this idea of payback, of trying to contain things, of trying to bottle things, um, our sin was looking back. And the whole work is about failures of containment. And late capitalism in various ways tries to bottle time and sell it back to us, as I've been describing. And her work is all about the breached space. The, uh, she has an image about how a line on a map shows the line of the shore. But the whole work is about the betrayal of that line, the myth of, or impossibility of containment. Life cannot be bottled. She says, lines make early graves and boundaries bleed. There are no borders, only the shimmering compression of time. She has the image of the fox, which in Japanese mythology is a threshold creature who moves between the living and the dead so that um, it's sort of the uh, the mortal spokesperson of the god Inari and the fox and all the uh, temples to Inari have a little hole in the base so a fox, the mythical fox can come in and out and report on the land of the living to the land of the dead. Both works play with this idea of opening and closing and there's a wonderful irony here. The Battersea project is all about an opening. This is, Battersea is reopening and of course unless you're a gazillionaire it's an enclosure. It's actually cl being closed off to the public. Um, and yet it's being marketed as an opening. The K Karen Kramer work is all about this failure of, of being enclosed. All the shops are closed and shut up in the Fukushima area. That has sort of been deserted. But the whole power of the piece comes from this notion of something being opened out, this refusal of the past to be contained, the past here, what happened in the ruptured sort of um, nuclear reactor is polluting the present all the time. And so how do we live ethically on time? I'm sort of going to end with that question helpfully because there are no clear answers. But I like the image of Janus here um, and to think how both works, perhaps the experience as humans of living in time is that we're always dragged between sort of um, looking fondly on the past and howling at the future. And if we just look um, at the seam or the join between Janus's two heads, perhaps that is where it is best to live, at that threshold that is neither one thing nor the other. Um, both of the works have this image of suspension, of a threshold. Uh, in Williams's work, the mindful person is described as a frozen deity. In Kramer, we have human life figured as a sad suspension. So I think it would be good to sort of uh, finish on that idea of doubleness and perhaps consider, is this how we have to live going forward in time, not commodifying it in a nostalgic way and not being afraid of it, not being afraid of the true present as it unfolds. Thank you for your attention. Corporatization of um, sort of social interaction. And it's something that I've 
sort of seen and something that I've been thinking about, but I've been thinking about it maybe more in terms of gamification. Mm -hmm. And when I say gamification, this idea of you're thinking about what to post and what will be rewarded and what will get the most likes, what will get the most retweets, what will get the most comments. It's something that Charlie Brooker actually talks about a little bit, I think, in like a documentary a few years ago. And I, I think out of all the periods I've maybe read, it's the one that I feel like that most sort of fits in, I feel like, with my experience. And it's what you talk about, you've spoke about when that really heartbreaking sort of thing your students said about being irrelevant and that complete fear of being irrelevant. So I've been thinking about this gamification in terms of certain behaviours being rewarded and as a result certain behaviours being encouraged, certain behaviours rewarded, thing, and then those rising to the surface and this whole idea of visibility is yeah. that's being really, really important. I will get to the point a little bit, I'm, kind of going, I'm going a little bit long winded, okay, but um, thinking about this in terms of what bodies are rewarded online and which bodies are not rewarded online. So this idea of these algorithms specifically picking and choosing for us what we see. So before these algorithms were in place, there was a sense that everyone had a voice. And for example, specifically with selfies, people of colour and pe um, people who identified as queer, they used it as an expression of visibility. It's kind of like in a political act in a sense. But that, because of these algorithms, that's now changing and now people that have privileged bodies in a sense are becoming visible. So I suppose I maybe wanted to ask you about sort of the consequences and what we can do. There was recently um, a huge interest in an alternative model of social media, which is Elo, which kind of seemed to kind of rocket out of nowhere and they didn't sort of have the capability to, um, I suppose, house everyone so that everyone can sign up and then that interest completely kind of disappeared very quickly. I suppose my question is just asking, is there, do you see, does that demonstrate a kind of urge of people wanting an alternative model and this sort of way of algorithm of privilege and this like gamification or do you feel like we're going to kind of, kind of continue on this route and which way will Facebook develop I suppose? Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's a re I love, I'm really glad that you brought up this gamification idea because, you know, the whole, one of the things that strikes me thinking about digital life is that there's so much and happiness, and especially with young people, and yet there is a sense that they couldn't survive without it, that they wouldn't, that, that, you know, my students say to me, you know, but I have no choice, I have to engage and participate in these things, and to many extent, to my, uh, I mean, they're right. Um, going back to time, though, and games, I think that there was a wonderful democracy about time. Time is democratic to all of us. Time is what has made David Duchovny now look 50 and not 30. Um, but, and this, is ha this happens to all of us, and in a way that the early programs of social media replicated this, when it was whatever how boring or banal or sensational it was, the most current thing um, arrived at the top. And there was a sort of democracy about that. And I think from that, you do get this ability uh, for social media, which I've been sort of down on it, but I mean, it has many brilliant social um, uses and functions, or and especially it did do, um, but which allowed this sort of queering and people in the margins to occupy the same sort of width or slice of time in a timeline. And now what we're seeing is this dreary rehash of a capitalist model where it's the super bloggers who get bumped to the top, sponsored posts get bumped to the top. And what we see is there are these uh, resistances all the time. So. There's a new company that is looking for sponsorship on Indiegogo for the smart house, which it's called Zoe, and it'll be a smart house that can turn your light, you can program to turn your lamps on and start the kettle brewing, but um, it won't be sort of linked into the cloud, so it's that sort of privacy. The kids now think of Facebook as a completely open forum and use Snapchat and other devices and the whole idea of ephemeral social media in which things are hidden and aren't retained. So I think we're constantly in a period of flux and readjustment. And what will have to happen in order, uh, moving forward, we're going to have to abandon this capitalist occupation of our common spaces and just not tolerate it. And the same sort of almost labor movements that need to be happening on the ground need to be happening in the streets and the architecture of platforms. And just you know, strike. Why do we put up with it? Just have Facebook strike in this idiotic sense that the top people will, top posts will get privileged and be present and not others. Yeah. It, is, it was possible. You mentioned, you mentioned the adverts on uh, that, that came into Facebook. Mm -hmm. It was perfectly possible to um, 
to, to get rid of each mm. advert separately. Yeah. And I did. Yeah. And I, I stopped getting them. Right. So it was, I mean, they've changed the whole format now. Yeah. So the adverts come out slightly, uh, come yeah. in a different way. But yeah, I can't have been the only one who, who clicked the cross at the top uh, and persevered when they asked me mm. why I wanted to get rid of this and yeah. how could I possibly have wanted to get rid of it. Yeah, no, no totally. And they give you lots of, um, like, are you sure? Um, clicking on a Google advert, you know, if, if you don't know about this, you won't be able to tell your friends about it. There's all these weird threats at the brink of destruction as you're sort of trying to kill this thing. Um, but you're exactly right. I mean, what you were enacting was a form of political resistance, right? Saying, I'm not tolerating this. And other people who are more tech savvy than me say, well, just get ad blocker. But there's always these sort of um, cat and mouse games of how advertisements sort of come through to you. And my thing, my response to that would really be, why should the default be an advert? You know, why should, I'm really annoyed at the fact that the double deckers have sort of, um, you know, shoe, gym shoes all over them, you know, and driving around London. Why should the default be um, a billboard, not a blank wall in common spaces? And so, although it is possible um, to remove them, I don't think that, I think there should be an opting in, not an opting out process. But yeah. I see it goes moving now into Pinterest. Yeah. Pinterest. Yeah. Just because I like art and yeah. I follow art, and uh, they're now putting sponsored ones that will come up at the top. Yeah. Uh, and you cannot tell to those last stuff. <laughs> yeah, a timeless campaign looks good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the thing with that is that, you know, the Monopoly man would say to me, you know, well, if you want all this free stuff, it needs to be funded somehow. Um, but perhaps there's another way around it, you know, that, it, you know, state-owned social media, for instance, that we, instance that we pay into, like, a BBC TV license or something. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any other additional questions from anyone? Anything at all. Everyone's being very shy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bear with me because I'm going to make this up to go along. Um, but while you were talking, I started thinking um, in part about um, the effect of social media and how increasingly it's, it's a generational thing that younger, uh, younger people don't use Facebook, they don't use the archive partly because of the savviness about what that archive means for them in the future, um, and partly because it's, um, in a way, that's, that's maybe, maybe the next step forward. And, mm -hmm. you know, the first generation of internet users, it strikes me that there's a relationship between how um, the first generation of people who experience telephones used to try and use that technology to communicate with the dead in some ways. Mm -hmm. The archive is the sort of preserver or this kind of way of communicating with something that is, is lost. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm curious about what you think is the future of the past mm -hmm. as we go forward, you know, when yeah. we no longer um, feel this need to perpetually archive ourselves, um, which might happen, which might not happen, but it might. Yeah, there'll be a sort of technological Buddhism, wouldn't there, in terms of this sort of by accident, we sort of bounce ourselves into sort of an Eastern philosophical framework just because the archiving and commercialization has been so annoying and so intolerable that we think actually the past isn't worth a candle. It's be, I'm not having it sort of preserved in this way. I love um, this idea of what is the future of the past because you're right, the, the, the idea of ephemeral social media again being that the past is a sort of enemy, the past is a weapon and we best outrun it. Um, and what that will do for self-formation. If that does happen, the, what that will signal, I would say, if the past becomes devalued in that way, it will mean some sort of triumph over a late capitalist commercialized model. And why I say that, I mean, a lot of young people are adopting or hungry for ephemeral social media, but at the same time, and a lot of my students will say things like, to one another, if they're having a fun night out and someone takes a picture of it, they'll warn the other one and say, don't post that till nine o'clock tomorrow morning. If you post it now, no one will see it. It's the middle of the night. So they're very much concerned of the strategies of visibility and of making the past important. Um, one of the ways in which 
I, I like this idea of this communicating with the dead as well. Uh, I, I'm not sure I can really answer the theory of what will become of the past, but one way I think may tip it into a new realm is if we can't actually stomach the Gothic quality of digital life. And what I mean by that, it's been written a lot um, now, including in my book, about the idea of social media being a vast graveyard, that people will die on it, that their um, profiles will remain active and still spew out sort of notifications and exist in this strange half-life. Charlie Brooker has, a, has um, a dark mirror episode, black mirror episode about that, about someone who has died but is reincarnated using their sort of online archive that you were mentioning. And I had a really strange case of this where um, someone I'd known in France, um, he died and I hadn't known. I'd been out of touch with him for three years and all of a sudden, um, I, it, Facebook one late, I, it was late at night, it was like two in the morning and I thought, oh, it's his birthday today. And I clicked on it and all these people were giving these really sort of poignant uh, messages and I thought, that's a bit much for a birthday. And then I realized that he died three years before, just after, not long after I had sort of lost touch with him. And then I looked at all the people using Facebook as, as exactly as you said, the telephone, as a conduit to the dead, and using it not as, I mean, as evidence of his life, really, but as a way of communicating with him. And his mother was on it all the time the year after that he died, posting on it, saying this, saying that, I miss you. And the fact that I had access to this felt very compromising anyway, these graveside whispers. Um, and then I discovered, because I got totally hooked in that ghoulish way that you do, I got hooked on this and um, realized that it went on her Facebook page, which I shouldn't have had access to either. I'd never met her. And I learned that she died a year after he had. So in the middle of the night, I'm in one of those classic digital age poses of in the dark with the blue light on you when you should be asleep. And I've been listening to one ghost mourn another ghost. And whatever people say about digital ages, nothing new is happening. It's all the same since Dickens' time. I think that is one new thing. And it has to do with this sense of the pastness of people being taken with us. So I'm not sure that completely answers your question, but you've made me think of some things. So thank you. Have we got any final questions? And that's, I think, an anxiety. Of the, uh, but you'll notice, um, I don't know if you noticed this, but last Mother's Day, I was wandering around the tube and there were big posters for getting your pictures imprinted onto physical objects. So there'd be cups and uh, cushions. And that's quite, I mean, that's been around since at least the 90s anyway. But I think it's funny it's having a resurgence now that it isn't considered tacky. And it's the sense of let's get these, let's move these digital things into the physical world of objects. Coming, um, those kind of things are coming back because there was a whole period where digital was so big, and actually a lot of people probably say, "Oh, I don't have those photographs." You know, they were on non-disc, yeah, they were on yeah, computer, or they were. So actually, having a hard copy, mm -hmm. um, I think it's maybe uh, and I was saying, because I, I feel that a lot of things have been lost. Uh, it's it's Yeah, I know. Well, I had an idea for a short story in which I thought that all the society, you would sort of check into these hotel institutions for the last 10 years of your life to 
just go through the archive of your footage, that we, we'd have amassed so much that we'd need this sort of 10-year retrospective, and there'd be a company which would curate it for you according to our interests. And you just sit there in this sort of seat with a big screen in front of you, a bit like Facebook, like recapping the year. This was the year that was. It would last for 10 years. I mean, you're so right. Like, I noticed on the high street, there's these radical new things, like places where you can get your photographs printed, <laughs> um, advertised proudly. So, yeah, it is a race to the past. It's brilliant. No, I think that's a great place to end.